This Automation Life. I'm your host, Jeremy Schubert. Each week, we discuss technology use, used in automation. And this week, we got with us Paul Oppenheim, sensor, sensor specialist with Brenner Fiedler. Thanks for joining us, Paul. Yeah, it's good to be here. Thank you. So this week, we're going to talk about through beam sensors versus retroflective. So, Paul, what's, what's the main difference between the two? Okay, well, when you are first working with, let's say, like a through beam sensor, you can think of it as that there's actually two pieces to this. You have like one housing that holds, let's say, will be the transmitter that sends the beam. And then you have another housing, let's say, on the other side of, let's say, the conveyor belt or whatever you're, you're shooting across where the receiver is. Uh, where you might have seen something like this would be, let's say, uh, at the bottom of a garage door. If you have like an automated garage door, you have uh, one of those through beam sensors. Let's say at the very bottom, you'll see there'll be like a transmitter on one side and a receiver on the other. And that's the, exactly the don't squash your cat. That's sensor, exactly yes. the don't squash your cat sensor. Okay. Exactly. Uh, a retroreflective, on the other hand, um, is a little different. Where you have the one housing that holds both the transmitter and the receiver in the same housing. And what it shoot, looks at at the opposite side, again, of the conveyor or whatever you're going across would be an actual reflector that reflects the light back to the receiver. So that's the main difference as far as its physical properties. Okay. Okay. So how is that reflector different than uh, like a standard bike reflector? Um, good question. Uh, some of them actually are not that far removed from a, a, a standard bike reflector depending on the type of light that you're shooting out. Uh, but usually when you're using uh, retroflective sensors, uh, the ones that are uh, more of an industry standard, use what's called a corner cube reflector. And what that does is it allows for uh, when you shoot the light out of the transmitter of the um, retroflective sensor, it's passing through what's called a horizontal filter that only allows those particular rays of light to go out. When it hits the reflector, it then literally rotates that light 90 degrees and sends it back to the receiver and the receiver has a vertical filter on it, so it's only looking for that light coming back. And the reason for this is so that if the target that you're trying to detect happens to be a very shiny target, let's say a highly reflective surface, which could be maybe like a glossy material, or maybe it's metal, or maybe it's uh, a mirror or something, that the light that's being reflected off of that glossy target uh, will be scattered in all sorts of directions and will not be recognized by the receiver. So it will be able to distinguish between a glossy target versus the reflector and can determine the difference between the two. Wow. So, yeah, there is some actual okay. fairly complicated things that go inside here. The good news is you as the user don't even have to worry about that. Cool. But that's part of the package with the reflector. So you kind of touched on the uses, but are there any like specific places where you would want to use one versus the other, or why would you? Why would you not just always use a, a through beam or always use a retro reflector? That's a really good question. Um, a lot of times it depends, uh, usually based on the application and setup. Um, in situations where, let's say, where the targets are normally what you'd say an opaque material, meaning something that light will not penetrate, uh, I generally recommend using a through beam sensor. Uh, usually the reason for that being is that the light's only traveling the one direction from the transmitter to the receiver. Uh, and that comes in handy especially in environments where there could be where it could be prone to a lot of dust buildup or uh, just maybe it's a very oily environment, dirty, whatever the case might be, where stuff might start to settle on the sensor after a while. Uh, you want to be able to uh, make sure that that light reaches from the transmitter to the receiver um, at all times as much as possible so we can definitely distinguish between the target presence versus absence. I would imagine like if there's a big distance between the transmitter and receiver then the same idea you would want to go sure. with the through beam. Absolutely so right because have to travel twice. It, you got okay. it exactly so let's say let's just throw an example out there let's say if um, I'm shooting across let's say um, even if it's just, let's say, like a, a two feet, let's say, from the transmitter to the receiver, with a through beam, you're only traveling two feet. But with a retroflective, you're technically traveling four feet because the light has to travel to the reflector and come back. Okay. So as a result, the beam gets that much weaker as more light is dispersed in the space. Some will get off the reflector and come back. Other might go beyond the reflector and such. And so, so if it's dirty, it's basically twice as dirty also. Because that's, it's got to go in and out of both the scissor and the reflector. That, that's exactly okay. right. So 
right from that get-go, one might think, well, then why on earth would I ever use a retroreflective sensor? It sounds like through beam would be the way to go at all times. It seems really reliable, yeah. It does. Yeah. Now, um, <clears throat> there's a couple advantages where the um, retroreflective is better than the through beam. And one of the advantages with a, a through beam, remember you, I mentioned it, where there's two different distinct housings, which means you have there are two electrical components, which means you have two wires coming out, which means you have to have technically a way of being able to send power to both of those. Um, so let's say if I'm setting this up to shoot across a conveyor, I have to power up the transmitter and then I have to somehow get power to that receiver. Well, if I'm in a situation where I'm looking, let's say, across a conveyor on the other side of that conveyor belt, let's say I have a wall or some sort of, um, just the way the fixturing is, it might be difficult to get a power supply or something behind there it's a lot easier to just simply put a reflector there, which requires no power whatsoever. It's just a reflector. I imagine space constraint too. If it's a tight area over there, you right. can't run cables. So and, and or uh, sensor, you know, or even there's reflective tape, right? Sure, so, absolutely. Just, okay. Yep, and that's one example. Then another example is again, as I was kind of alluding to a little bit ago, where we're talking about the actual application itself. Let's say that the target you're looking at isn't necessarily an opaque target. Let's say it's more of a transparent target. Maybe it's a, a glass bottle that's coming by. Well, the problem with the through beam is a lot of times the through beams are so powerful that they might not be able to distinguish between the presence and absence of a glass bottle because it's just so powerful. Or you might get what's kind of called a double shot where it sees the leading edge of the glass and the trailing edge of the glass because the very ends of the glass, if you look at it, might the curve. But, right, the curve, yeah. exactly. Yeah. That okay. tangent point space might block the light, but when you're looking dead center through the glass, the light passes through it. So now it will confuse your controller thinking that two objects passed through when in reality only one went through. Mm -hmm. Whereas a retroreflective sensor, it, since you're passing the light through it twice, okay, it has that ability to, a lot of them have the built-in circuitry, so it can actually dis discern between a transparent versus no object whatsoever. And so that's another advantage where a retroflect would be better over a through beam. Cool. Okay. So, so. they got a through beam is best for distance, yep. dirty environments, mm -hmm. maybe just general usage. Right. And retroflector, if you want to make the install easier, mm -hmm. your clear targets, uh, or space constraint even. That's right. Okay. Pretty much. Cool. Any difficulties with setting either one up or aligning them? How do you set that? Um, usually, um, what most of these sensors will have like an indicator light to let you know uh, whether okay. they have it aligned or not. And most of them now also have a, um, they're a red LED source transmitter. So you can actually see the light as, okay. <laughs> as it's you know, uh, as it hitting the receiver or with the reflector as it comes back. It'll give you a little indicator light to letting you know that you have that aligned. Okay, mm -hmm. cool. Um, now, what about always with the sensors, people break them. Is there anything, any way to prevent it or? Sure. Again, it kind of depends on how, how you mount it. Uh, if those things were taken into consideration, uh, and let's say for whatever reason uh, you have no choice but to mount the sensor in what might be considered harm's way, there are different types of brackets you can purchase now that are like stainless steel, very thick, that could serve as a protective housing for the sensor. So it takes the brunt of all the impact. Let's say if it's hit by a tool or something like that. Uh, and then we also now have uh, stainless steel sensors instead of the traditional plastic ones that they themselves can take extreme abuse to. Also good for, let's say, uh, wash down situations. Let's say if you're working in uh, factories where you're making, let's say, food or something where there's a lot of, you know, wash and rehose something at the end of the shift. Uh, these uh, stainless steel sensors are excellent for those types of situations. They Cool. So the IP rating on... Uh, yeah, good question. A lot of the IP ratings uh, of the new stainless steel can handle up to, I think they call it an IP69K, which means okay. they can, it, they're oil resistant. Yeah. Okay. A lot of the uh, solutions that they use aren't just simply hot water. They might have a specific type of soapy or a, an oil type of based solution just when they're washing down. Okay. Certain alkalides or acids might be involved. So. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. Okay. Well, um... I think that that's a pretty good overview of the difference. I hope that uh, it's helpful for everybody. Anything else that you think that um, are the two sensors we haven't covered that we should share? Or um, I, I think that covers up as far as I right? can think of. I mean, okay. yeah, as far as those two. Mm -hmm. Cool. Okay. Um, well, this is uh, This Automation Life. If you have any additional questions about the through beam or retroreflective sensors or anything else in general, you can email us at tech at brfa.com. 
uh, stay tuned because we're going to have some future episodes coming up. Uh, we're going to talk about NPN versus PNP in the future, discuss circuit breakers, and uh, we'll get into some more interesting topics. So uh, keep in touch with us, and uh, we hope you can listen in the future.